Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Building Responsibly, a technical webinar hosted by eConcrete. My name is Andrew Rella, and I am a coastal and environmental engineer specializing in the ecological enhancement of coastal and marine infrastructure. Today, we will be joined by three expert speakers who will share their insight and experience on what Building Responsibly means to them in regards to coastal and marine infrastructure, as well as sustainable energy production in the form of offshore wind. Our speakers include Dr. Todd Bridges, a senior research scientist with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Cole Roberts, America's energy business leader at Arab, and Joseph Sakawi, the Waterfront Design Associate Director for the Waterfront Alliance. In a moment, I will hand you over to my two colleagues and co-hosts for the program, Heather Weitzner, a coastal engineer, whose work is focused in shoreline protection, natural nature-based features, as well as hydrodynamic and sediment transport modeling of offshore infrastructure. Heather will be joined by Karen O'Brien, who is a chemical engineer with over 20 years of concrete experience, specializing in the specification and technical compliance. However, before I hand it over to Heather and Karen for the rest of the facilitated discussion and panelist presentations, as many of you may be aware, one year ago yesterday, Dr. Shimmer Perkel Finkel, the CEO and co-founder of Econcrete, tragically passed away. Shimmer was a friend, a colleague, mentor, and more personally, a mother, wife, daughter, and a sister. Shimmer's dedication and discipline to changing the world for the better was without bounds, with Econcrete being only one avenue in which she strove to make the world a better place. Being recognized as a global leader for her efforts by the United Nations, Forbes Mag Magazine and countless other outlets, it is only fitting that we commemorate the one year of her passing on International Women's Day. We will now share a brief video that was filmed prior to Schumert's passing. We I will now leave you on this note. Let's build responsibly together and have Karen and you introduce you to our first guest. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for that, that, beautiful, that beautiful tribute. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. A few housekeeping items after our panelists' presentations and discussion, we'll have time for a short Q&A. Please enter your questions into the Q&A panel uh, at the bottom of your screen. You can enter the questions at any time, but we won't be addressing them until the last 10, 10 minutes of the webinar. After the webinar concludes, within about 10 days, you'll receive an email with a certificate of attendance, as well as a link to the recording of the webinar. Um, we're happy that you're here with us today, but if you need to reference it back, you'll have that resource for you. So today I have the honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Todd Bridges. Todd is a senior professional ST within the US Army where his responsibilities include leading research, development, and environmental initiatives for the US Army and the US Army Corps of Engineers. He is the national lead for the US Army Corps of Engineers Engineering with, with Nature Initiative, which includes a network of research, field scale applications, collaborations, and communication activities to advance nature-based solutions. Thank you so very much, Todd, for joining us today. And if you will give me one minute to get your presentation up. While you're doing that, Karen, I think I'll say what an honor it is to be here today to celebrate Schumann's life and her work. And a part of Schumann's work was, I think, pursuing a new arrangement with nature. Through the process, 
of building and working with nature. If you could go to the next slide. I'm not gonna make much reference to coastal systems because as we were talking before we began uh, our event today, sometimes it's useful to look outside of your particular domain to see how work in other areas relate and how to make progress together. These are numbers for the United States and what we built during what I call the century of infrastructure. And the numbers represented on the far left are impressive by most standards. All of this was accomplished in 100 years. And in building this infrastructure, we used a lot of concrete and rock and brick and asphalt and metal, the substance of infrastructure development. And in fact, we reached a milestone on planet Earth in the year 2020 uh, from a paper published in Nature uh, in December of 2020, the amount of humid made mass in the form of these materials in 2020 now exceeds the total biomass on planet Earth. More than one teraton, that's 10 to the 12th metric tons, concrete, rock, brick, and asphalt used to develop infrastructure. And in fact, the doubling rate for human made mass in the 20th century is 20 years. Every 20 years, the amount of human made mass doubled. And it makes you wonder where this is going. Um, and more to the point, when we consider what we're gonna be doing in the rest of the 21st century, the World Economic Forum estimates that $100 trillion will be spent on infrastructure by mid-century. How can we incorporate nature within that? And concrete is a part of this uh, uh, effort. About 30 billion metric tons of concrete are used every year. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that in, on the planet. But you can construct a wall 60 feet tall and 60 feet wide around the planet with 30 billion metric tons of concrete. And we'd also need to mention the carbon footprint of cement manufacture for traditional concrete. As much as 8 to 10 percent of all carbon emissions come from concrete. Next slide. So when we look forward, it's also useful to look past and what people have thought about this and, and in times uh, gone by. Lewis Mumford was a, an intellectual giant. He was recognized by two former presidents, President Johnson and President Reagan. Uh, and in his book, The Myth of the Machine in 1970, he said this, I'll just read it. In the act of conquering nature, our ancestors too often treated the earth contemptuously under the delusion that the losses did not matter since modern man through science and invention would soon fabricate an artificial world infinitely more wonderful than the one that nature provided an even grosser delusion. So again, how can we incorporate nature into the built environment as we address the challenges and the opportunities of 21st century? Next slide, please. So while we do this, I, I, I'm in the Southwest right now. Well, not at this moment, but I've been traveling to the Southwest for the last several weeks. And I've had occasion to visit for the second time Hoover Dam. And between 1931 and 1936, this dam was built. It was at the time the largest concrete structure in the world. 3,250,000 yards of concrete was poured to build that structure. But that structure and that project was built for a different climate. In fact, Lake Mead, which is impounded by this dam, is only today at 35% of its capacity due to a mega drought, which has more or less engulfed the the Southwest region of the United States. So when we consider infrastructure in the future, how do we need to adapt our approaches? How do we need to, if you will, kind of revolutionize our approaches? And I think nature is a key to doing that. Next slide, please. As we, as we consider this, this opportunity, um, you know, I just wanna make reference to this initiative, which we start, started in the Corps of Engineers back in 2010, so 12 years ago. But it's based upon a foundation of decades and decades and decades of practice, not only within the Corps of Engineers, but in other organizations around the world, in which we're working to unite, to integrate, to harmonize natural systems with engineered systems to deliver more sustainable infrastructure. Infrastructure that delivers broader value in terms of economics or environmental or social benefits. Next slide. As, we, as, we have pursue, as we're pursuing this approach and working across sectors in order to develop 
uh, different kinds of projects. The next slide highlights, if you can see that, I'm not seeing it in, in the next slide, but I just wanted to illustrate, you know, a simple example of, you know, trees are infrastructure. The trees are habitat for birds. Uh, children like to climb trees, maybe even some adults, but there are a whole range of services that trees provide that can be likened to engineering functions, whether you're talking about cooler shaded surfaces or the cooling brought about by evapotranspiration, uh, reducing wind speeds in the winter, reducing therefore heating costs for buildings, local air quality, infiltration of water, reducing flooding risks are just a few of the examples of considering trees as infrastructure. So with the last slide, I just want to highlight uh, a cycle, a, a series of relationships that we need to consider as we pursue infrastructure in the 21st century. Water and carbon and diversity, biodiversity and people and human systems are all inextricably linked. Whether we're trying to prevent flooding, too much water, or conserve water in the case of drought, or we're trying to sequester carbon into mangroves or wetlands or promote biodiversity given that we're facing or we're in the middle of the sixth great uh, mass extinction on planet Earth, but it can serve people. And nature-based solutions are a way of doing that. And I think the work of Econcrete is uh, emblematic of and represents some of these opportunities to integrate nature into infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. That was a great presentation. And as a reminder to our guests, we'll have time later for a Q&A session in case you have any questions for Todd. Um, but now I'm happy to introduce our next panelist, Cole Roberts. Cole leads the energy business for Arab in North and South America, and he is the energy and sustainability team leader in Arab's San Francisco office. Specializing in design, planning, and consultation in the new and existing built environment, Cole has contributed to hundreds of projects that are positively shaping the world. His work ranging from individual buildings to climate positive communities, from energy and climate policy to in the ground infrastructure is recognized as unconventional, inspiring and synergistic. So thank you so much for joining us today, Cole. I know our guests and I are excited to hear your presentation. So please take it away when you're ready. Thanks, Heather. Uh, and Heather, I trust you can see my screen. Yep, perfect. So I wanted to um, yeah, honor Shimrit. I actually met her, I guess now 2018. And uh, a lot of the a lot of the work or at least the inspiration for some of the conversation I'm going to share with you today is based on that early introduction to her and the subsequent conversation. So it's an honor to be here today and and share with you a little bit of our journey at Arup. Uh, for those of I mean, it was it was it was good to hear Todd and and the Army Corps of Engineers. That, really needs no introduction. Arup probably does need a little bit of an introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know our perspective, we're a, a mid-sized firm these days, about 15,000 people, multidisciplinary across the world, focused on total design. And total design for us is across the planning, engineering, and, and technical specialties that, that shape the built environment. We are also employee owners, uh, so we are not publicly traded and we set our own course and direction. Uh, we tack our boat and we move it forward as we feel is best uh, serving um, our clients and our communities. And that inspires us uh, to do the things that we think are most important and that uh, a big part of that right now is delivering an affordable, resilient and clean energy transition. And we, we work across this ecosystem and we really do see it as an ecosystem, not a supply and a demand, but a transactional space with many different interests and people and technologies all needing to work synergistically and holistically to keep our communities alight, our economy moving and our livelihoods secure. Offshore wind is certainly a big part of that, which is how I come to you a bit today. Now, our energy system is in a time of profound transition. Uh, if you're not aware of that already, then you've, you've probably missed some of the recent news. It's driven by grid destabilization, 
uh, the penetration of larger and larger amounts of renewables, the electrification of our mobility and our buildings, the demand for climate action, zero net energy and carbon neutral power, innovative business models, community driven and public private partnerships, and new knowledge about our future climate, our present climate and digital technology. A few years ago, Arab committed itself as part of our structure to the sustainable development goals as an overarching theme and detailed target setting for every one of our projects. So we must align these two things, the energy transition and the 17 sustainable development goals. Offshore wind is an opportunity, we think, for that alignment in SDG 14, life below water partly because of the tremendous acceleration in the infrastructure that is going to be and is already being installed offshore in North America, as well as in Europe, Asia, and other parts of the world. We, uh, as I mentioned, have had a relationship with Econcrete for some time now, and are pleased to be part of a, an effort working with Econcrete and Holcim on uh, the uh, Department of Energy funded uh, research project to develop a cost-effective and ecologically positive solution for scour protection measures at offshore wind farms, structuring life below water. We do that within the broader context of what we think is necessary for digital acceleration in offshore wind from early phase planning through design, construction, operation and maintenance and decommissioning. And for years, we've had different um, tools and development processes and, and consulting arrangements around the deployment, the optimization of foundations, construction data management, and the extent, life extension of the assets and in a management platform. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of these today within the context of structuring life below water. So SCALE is a, an early phase deployment model to help de-risk and site offshore wind installations at a fairly discrete scale to improve the life cycle, the um, levelized cost of energy, uh, address entitlement risk, and um, steer clear of site constraints. So just a few examples, not exhaustive here. You can see shipping channels in the left, leaseholds in the middle, and fishing activity on the right. Notably, all three of these as examples are above water, right? They're the activities that take course above the waterline effectively. And we think that there's an additional layer, which is the ecological layer that needs to be layered into this model in order to help de-risk and positively shape the result of the infrastructure and the investment that's going in offshore. And that that happens across foundation types. So we obviously work in shallow water, mid-depth and deep. And the foundation solution is different for that levelized cost of energy and the overall life extension of the assets. So you get into the next phase and more detailed design and optimization of foundations, monopiles, jackets. And you note that below the waterline, those foundations are all different already. They are different and they can be optimized to reduce the amount of steel and the cost associated with them to improve the, the performance of the overall system. We believe that life below water, structuring life below water in appropriate fashion has the opportunity to be optimized in a similar way. So circling back to this work with E-Concrete and Holcim, we see an opportunity to pull that in tangibly, not just to create life below water, but to help address the levelized cost of energy, which is driving that widespread adoption of offshore wind. And I'll highlight just four aspects in the top, and that's the, the development cost, the capital cost, the operating cost and the decommissioning costs of offshore structures. Entitlement risk is a tremendous risk for developers that we think can be reduced if there is a positive 
relationship with local communities, fisheries that see an opportunity to create an abundance of life to strengthen that economy while similarly encouraging the offshore wind development. CapEx could also be reduced. Operating costs, if we're able to reduce the, the impact of scour on offshore foundations, that'll be a tremendous benefit. And certainly decommissioning. Do all of the structures, should all of the structures be removed uh, at the end of the day and the seabed made back to original condition or is there an opportunity for structured life below water and for that to further reduce the levelized cost of energy and promote the overall fishery and below water environment. That's what we're exploring and we're excited to be doing it in partnership, not just for the life below water, but for a lot of the sustainable development goals to be advanced. And we, we try to connect all of these, uh, as you know, the ocean is an ecosystem and that ecosystem connects across our humanity, uh, our birds and fish that travel upstream into the land and uh, our economy and our cities. So with that, I'll turn it over. And I believe that was about eight minutes or so, Heather. Thank you very much, Cole. I'll take it from here. Great job. Good job with timing, everyone. Uh, I uh, really appreciate your unique, unique perspective and, and really any tie into the unit sustainability goals is, is good for everybody. I will now introduce our final speaker of the webinar, Joseph Sakawi. Joseph leads the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program developed by the Waterfront Alliance. Wedge is the gold standard for resilient, accessible, and ecologically sound waterfront design. Joseph collaborates with project architects, engineers, and sponsors on waterfront projects and partners with agencies, financial institutions, and municipalities on incentives to encourage resilience. Previously, Joseph was a senior consultant at CARP Strategies, a New York City-based urban planning and economic development consulting firm where he led projects in infrastructure and sustainability. So happy to have you here, Joseph. Thank you so much and go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you for this introduction. It's an honor to, to be here today and to, to do this, especially so close to the um, anniversary of Shimmerit's passing. I think at, at Waterfront Alliance, we have just incredible respect for her and her vision. And I think you'll see a lot of elements of um, her vision reflected in um, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines or WEDGE program that, that we'll talk about today. So the WEDGE program um, is a rating system based out of the Waterfront Alliance here in New York City. Waterfront Alliance is an organization that inspires and affects resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. We are primarily a, an organization focused on the New York Harbor region, except that our WEDGE program is built to be um, a nationally applicable standard. So when we think about the WEDGE program, the, the, the image that you're seeing on the screen is, is one of the desired outcomes that we're looking at. So we're, we are looking at Brooklyn Bridge Park um, here in New York City, and you've got a couple different things going on. So we have tons of resilience features built into this space. When I, I talked to the, the director of um, capital programs there a few weeks ago, and he was just adamant that this park is going to withstand any storm that um, the 21st century can throw at it better than other New York parks because it has resilience built into the design. So you have on the right side, um, a, a berm built in, there's a wave attenuator built into the marina, parts of the upland structures are, are elevated. You have access features here. So we've got direct water access with the kayaker. You can kind of see the dog on the, uh, on the beach there. You can get right down to the water at this space. And then you have tons of ecological features at this site. So it's, it's actually kind of hidden by the big green circle, but um, we have concrete tide pools that are built into the, into the riprap here. There are um, multiple kind of ecological features that are built throughout the, the park, both in the water and out of the water, um, which really make this a, a great space. And this all happens in the context of 
a working waterfront here in in New York City that you have um, that 514 vessel that's that's um, at birth there. That's actually at the park. Uh, we have the maritime infrastructure built into the facility. And I apologize if you can hear the sirens behind me. It's proof that I'm in New York City. Um, and then further behind that, you see the, the um, ship to shore cranes in the background. That's Brooklyn Port Authority Marine Terminal. That's an active container facility. So you can have all of these functions in kind of all adjacent with each other, all um, interacting with each other. So Wedge at its heart is a rating system. We're made up of categories within each of those categories are a series of credits um, assigned to a, to a point system. And in a minute, we'll get into kind of what all is in there. The benefits of Wedge verification are that we're creating savings through resilience, reducing risk through long-term planning. Um, Wedge facilitates productive community engagement because it creates a kind of tangible outcome for communities. We leverage maritime activation. We enable savings through green infrastructures. And, and above all, you know, Wedge is a way to show that you are a leader in resilient and accessible and sustainable design. So we have 10 wedge verified projects across the country. Most of those are in New York because that's where the program started. Uh, we just had our first in 2021, our first non-New York City project uh, become wedge verified. Um, it's North, Wilm or North Waterfront Park in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, there's another six in the pipeline right now. Um, and what I want to point out is that there are a ton of different land uses on this slide. So we have Starlight Park, North Waterfront Park, Hunters Point South, these are all public parks. You have um, um, Sims Recycling, you have McKinnis Cement Oak Point, which are both industrial facilities, Domino Sugar and Bronx Point are residential facilities or that, that have a, a public water, uh, waterfront component. So we have opportunities to kind of build in resilience, ecology and access across all different types of land uses and in ways that support the working waterfront. So to dive into, and just, and I'll do this at a very high level because we don't have a ton of time, uh, but to dive into what's actually in the, the system. So our category zero is about site assessment and planning. So doing kind of the kind of upfront homework so that you can um, inform the long-term planning aspects of the design and ensure that you've done kind of all the assessments that you need to do to, to create a robust design. Community engagement also factors in here in a, in, a, in a very big way. We then look at responsible siting and coastal risk reduction. So this is where most of the resiliency components come in. So are you doing wet and dry flood proofing, elevating um, facilities, elevating critical assets? Are you avoiding ecologically sensitive areas? Are you supporting water dependent uses? All of those factors come in into, into the category one. Category two is a, around public access, um, community access and connection. So here we're looking for, are you creating a welcoming and, and just exceptional waterfront public space? Um, are you reducing industrial impacts? Are you providing programming? Are you increasing transportation, maritime related employment opportunities? Are you connecting to waterfront greenways? All of these kind of things that make a public space work well are what we're looking for on sites. Edge resilience um, is where um, a, a few more kind of resilience features come into play. And here's where we're looking really closely at um, the actual waterfront edge itself. And this is really the section that, that kind of differentiates Wedge from LEED or Envision or Sites or any of the other kind of rating systems out there. It's that this is the one that's really focused on the waterfront edge itself because there's so many additional complications that come into planning on the waterfront. Um, so here we're really looking for, are you using an appropriate strategy for the context of the site and the use? wedge across the board is not prescriptive about here's how you have to build your waterfront, here's how you have to design it, because we know that every waterfront site is going to have different opportunities and different constraints. Um, so we, we use wedge as kind of a process to help guide you to what are the best outcomes in terms of resilience, ecology, and access. Um, 
and that can include sometimes a, a hardened shoreline uh, because that is required by the site based on different dynamics at the site or, or different uses. And, and then there's other times where we're you know, really pushing for a, a natural shoreline. Um, the ecologically enhanced structural components is where a lot of e-concrete solutions come in. Um, and we see a lot of sites that are, that are using you know, the tide pools, they're using different products um, to, to make it so that the bulkhead or the riprap add additional value. Natural resources is where more of our ecological components come into play. And here we're looking at ecosystem connectivity and biodiversity. We also have a lot of sustainable um, construction tactics like sustainable um, fill and soil management, um, cleanup uh, of contaminated sites, those sorts of things, and stormwater um, components all come into play in category four. And then there's a final category around innovation that's all about um, are you doing things that, that maybe don't fit into the wedge guidelines yet, but really e expand the, the intent of resilient ecological and accessible design well? Or for exemplary performance, are you just taking one of our, one of our standards and just knocking it out of the park? Um, and we wanna, we wanna reward that as well. I'll turn it back over to the, to the group so we can get um, into the Q&A discussion. Uh, we're at wedge.waterfrontalliance.org and happy to take your questions. Thank you, Joseph, and all of our panelists for your great perspectives on building responsibly. We'll now move on to the panel discussion, but I'd like to remind everyone that we will have time afterwards for a Q&A session where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. So if you have any questions for the panelists, please enter them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so Todd, let's start with you. Uh, based on your experience, what are the stakeholders that the Army Corps is engaging to bring the Engineering with Nature program to local communities, and what efforts are being made to implement this initiative nationally, both in Army Corps-led projects and others? That's a very big question, <laughs> but it is a, a very important uh, question. And I, I've been saying recently that the path to progress runs on the rails of relationships, especially where we need to innovate because there are risks involved, uh, hopefully compensating value propositions to be gained. So more emphasis, I would say, needs to be put on developing relationships and partnerships and collaborations in this space of, if you will, nature-based or nature-inclusive infrastructure. I mean, we're partnering at the international level with our recently released uh, guidelines on nature-based solutions for flood risk management that can be accessed from our website. But across federal government with, within the Department of Defense, we had a Navy workshop last week on installation level applications of these principles, but with NOAA National Park Service with states like Georgia and California, and also at the local level, uh, the New York City is a member of our network for engineering with nature. But this translation is quite important to be able to get projects on the ground because projects are built in places. You know, they're built uh, locally. Uh, NGOs are important, or like the Nature Conservancy and WWF and many, many others. But also importantly, I would say here, especially in this form, the private sector. Government and the private sector have to learn, I believe, how to collaborate and partner more effectively with each other to deliver true substantive innovation. I mean, we need innovation, and we also need to think and act big with respect to partnering in order to generate the scale of projects that are needed in regards to, say, climate resilience in the future and sustainability. That's going to require big-scale transformational projects, and that means the organizations that deliver that, they have to figure out how to partner big to deliver big. Great, great answer. Uh, this next question is for Cole. And Cole, considering the diverse array of stakeholders involved in offshore wind development, such as developers and regulators and blue economy industries, what do you see as a potential pathway of ensuring that implementation of ecologically responsible offshore wind infrastructure? Hi. I actually really loved what Todd went through because I think that that it is about relationships and it's a 
you know, we do a lot of work with cities, local government, as well as with the private sector and non-governmental organizations. And it's a it's extraordinary how often there's there's crossover in 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 opportunity and synergy and it's it's the convening and the mechanisms of communication and trust that are often uh, most uh, most undeveloped so uh, for for us we think that it is about bringing people together under a common vision uh, engaging across the different stakeholders having a clear champion in that process right a convener and and we do think that local government is uh, a, 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 a very good role for local government uh, and or non-governmental organizations. Um, sometimes business organizations uh, have been have been uh, effective at doing so. And then eventually moving on to incentivization and appropriate levels of regulation to support scaling uh, and acceleration of what needs to happen. And when we talk about how quickly things are moving on the ground, um, just the, the speed of change is, is one of the greatest risks for um, both not doing it right and, and succeeding. So, so there's, there's fantastic uh, re reports out there. We've got a great report out on the circular economy and its relationship to energy. And, and um, that would be a good one to, to maybe share afterwards with the attendees because it goes into great depth on uh, that collective action and the roles of the various stakeholders that can play play a part successfully together. Thanks, Cole. Yeah, um, we'll try to share that with the attendees. Okay, Joseph, this question is for you. Based on your experience, how have working waterfronts such as ports or manufacturing facilities integrated nature-based features and community access into their designs? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We've seen some some really exciting developments in in this space, um, and one of the things that kind of really makes a difference on a site is where you need is realizing kind of where you need maritime infrastructure and then where you actually don't. So historically, and you know, we've made our, our our peers and our working waterfronts a hundred percent bulkhead wall or or pile supported deck, but really there's not always an operational or structural need to do that. So there's there's two wedge projects that that stand out in this regard. So we have Oak Point McKinnis Cement in the Bronx, which is a, a cement import facility. Um, and this was a property that, that was hit really hard in Sandy. And then they prioritized resilience in the redevelopment of the site. Um, so at this at this particular site, uh, based on the dredge depth, the the vessel sits about a hundred yards offshore and then the the cement is, is pumped in. So rather than just have that be kind of open space, they actually built out um, and planted a salt marsh between where the vessel sits and um, the, the actual upland facility. Um, they installed a, a wave attenuation system along the berth that protects the marsh and the upland facilities. Um, and then along the, the water's edge, they opened up space for community programming and a walkway and are able to move the piped cement over it you know, very easily in a way that, that there's no interference with operations at the site. Um, the team also just elevated the site um, several feet to take it out of the, to take it out of the floodplain. Um, so there were lots of ways that they could incorporate resilience and ecology and, and excess all within this site. The other site that comes to mind is the Sims Recycling Facility in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Um, and this is where they, they, they barge out bulk uh, materials. The wharf itself is only a small percentage of the site along, I think it's the Southern edge. Um, and the remaining portion of the facility was, um, had, had vegetated riprap to add ecological value they also incorporated a walkway along the water, a visitor center. They're, they've had the first commercial wind turbine in the in New York City and the site. There's multiple other kind of resilience and, and ecology strategies there. Um, the visitor center has things like a, a, a balcony that lets you watch the operations from a, a, a safe and secure space that again, doesn't actually have any interference with the operations. And when we were developing the wedge program, you know, the team was intentional about ensuring that these guidelines do work well on working waterfronts. 
and for something like access, we've built in systems. So you have kind of multiple options that can work on most types of, uh, of facilities. So even ones where you have kind of security or operations concerns, you know, there are ways that you can be creative about making sure that, 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 that the waterfront has access available. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Those look like really good examples of the balance between community need, operations, and ecological value. Um, okay, so we'll loop back around to Todd again. So considering the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which will disperse billions of dollars in funding highways, bridges, water infrastructure, and other construction in investments, and the recently introduced shore, Shoreline Health Oversight Restoration Resilience and Enhancement Act, or SHORE Act, in your opinion, will the availability of this funding accelerate and in any way prioritize the implementation of nature-based designs? Yes, thanks for the question. I, I, ha I had that same question in mind during consideration of uh, what's called IIJA, or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So I downloaded the legislation, and I did some reading and some word searching. And I was more than pleasantly surprised. I was strongly encouraged by the fact that the term natural infrastructure is used 17 times in that, in that legislation, 17. And if you look at what is being funded uh, under that term or very similar types of projects across that act. It's really billions and billions of dollars for agencies like the Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy, the Corps of Engineers, and a host of others. So the, the evidence is in fact there that we are on, I think, a positive trajectory with more sustainable infrastructure, nature-based or nature-inclusive infrastructure. I mean, in terms of my kind of personal experience, I have testified before Congress two times in the last nine months. In the preceding 29 years of my career, never, but in the last nine months, twice. And both of them were in hearings devoted to the topic of natural infrastructure. So once last summer before the Senate and, and just last week before the House Science Committee. So what I see in terms of evidence is that Nature-based solutions, natural infrastructure is getting a lot of attention where it matters uh, at the level of decision makers. And I, I think we're not only on the right trajectory, but the trajectory is up. And so I, I think that presents a challenge to those of us in the field of delivering projects in government and within industry. Okay, time to do it, you know, and, and to document what is being accomplished so that we can relate that back to the investment being made. You know, what are the benefits that are gonna be achieved through delivering these kinds of projects and the billions and billions uh, that are being invested in this kind of approach? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's good to see that it's on everyone's radar and the decision makers and, and at the top level and not just in the industry. It's really, really encouraging to see. Uh, Cole, I have another question for you. As the world is poised for a true energy revolution, and today obviously we focused on offshore wind energy, what additional sources of sustainable energy do you see should be prioritized to meet and align with those UN sustainable targets? Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I think I'll probably still anchor it into this community because you know there's a lot out there that that needs to happen in the overall energy system. Uh, what we are seeing in, in other parts of the world offshore, for example, is the repurposing of structures for uh, hydrogen production to meet one of, the one of the big challenges, which is intermittency of renewable energy production, right? So offshore hydrogen production so that we can, we can um, dispatch the energy uh, when, the, when the demand is present in the communities, uh, as well as repurposing for transmission uh, of the electricity, so there's 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 certainly a repurposing opportunity offshore. I think that the uh, the ports are playing a big role. Um, you know, they're a place of of funneling for uh, a lot of the goods and, and that comes into the the country, 
And as a result, they play a big role in the electrification of mobility and goods movement, which is part of the, the supply chain decarbonization that needs to happen. We spend a lot of our energy on moving things about and, um, and electrifying our infrastructure is a big part of that. So uh, maybe the last thing is to just note that all of this is within the context of, of, of a loading order. So all of the energy experts in the world will tell you that there's, there's kind of a priority lens and the first thing is always efficiency. Uh, and then uh, only later do we come to renewables as a source of, of meeting the remaining demand um, that we have and need in our system. So there's a great opportunity still for electrification and efficiency and then repurposing our assets. Great, thanks Cole, that's a really good perspective. Um, Joseph, this next question is for you. Can you highlight the importance of community engagement in the design process? And what are some best practices you would recommend to engage the community while meeting local stakeholder needs? That's a, a really great question and something that's really central to the wedge program and in the work of Waterfront Alliance more broadly. If, if we're going to emphasize public access on a site, we need to make sure that we're creating a space that the public would actually go and that that adds value to to the community. I think the the most important component of robust community engagement that I see is that it needs to be a two way conversation. And this is something that that gets missed in a lot of in a lot of development projects that, that you need to plan to report back to stakeholders about here are the things that we heard you say and that we have built into the project. Here are the things that we heard you say and think are great ideas, but aren't gonna work here and here's why. Um, that kind of justification for what was feasible, what wasn't and, and making it so that people understand here are the things that, that we could do. Here are the ways that we're being good neighbors. Here are the ways that we're trying to improve this site. Um, that's all really important. And that community engagement can build trust that's going to then serve you well in future projects. Or if you don't do it well, it's going to make it so that you're already starting the next project at a, at a disadvantage. One of the things that we've built into the wedge standards is that, you know, I, I mentioned that there's a, a community engagement process upfront um, that has um, a, a set of standards around what robust community engagement looks like, but we're also looking across many other credits at how did you, how is this part of the design influenced by what the community said they prioritized, what they said they valued. Um, and that's something that, that we ask projects to, to demonstrate for us. Um, and then I'd say just kind of one last piece is that, you know, in terms of best practices, think about going, um, going beyond kind of the, the, the big open Zoom or the big Zoom open house or, or as we move back to in-person, the, the big high school cafeteria uh, workshop, um, be creative about you know, how you're bringing people um, into the project, bring people to the site, vary engagement methods and, and feedback pathways, talk with trusted community, letter, uh, community leaders and have them host with you. Um, and then don't be afraid to show kind of the technical or operational sides of the project, because um, there's you know there there's lots that that we can learn from engaging the community in you know really meaningful ways. Yeah, that's great. I think a huge component of what you mentioned is listening. Yeah, so you go to the community, you get their feedback, and you integrate, and you actually listen to what they're saying. So it's nice that that's part of the wedge program. Um, okay, so I think this might be our last question before the Q&A session. I, I know uh, Todd has a, another engagement that he has to opt for, so we're going to shoot it over to him. Um, Todd, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges to implementing natural and nature-based features, and do you have any recommendations for overcoming them? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's a frequently expressed question, and in, in any time of innovation space, I think it's a useful question. I'm going to say that most of what might be considered obstacles in this space are really human problems <laughs> rather than technical ones. Um, it's 
it's uh, probably 80% a human problem. And that, that involves people maybe changing their processes, their, their business approaches, um, say their decision-making processes to consider a broader frame of interest. One of the questions that was posed asked the question in regards to regulatory decision-making. Certainly that's a space where, where innovation is necessary. I, I, in fact, I know of maybe no instances where there are professionals related to infrastructure development or the decision-making process or the regulatory process. I know nobody who escapes the need to innovate, whether you're talking about regula regulators or you're talking about engineers or or scientists. Um, so I, it's a it's a target rich environment, we might say. Um, these kinds of challenges, but I, I I think the prescription for addressing that need and overcome these obstacles is more dialogue, not just dialogue with people just like you who do what you do for a living, but with others, you know, across organizational boundaries and across sectors. That's the kind of substantive dialogue that's needed to work through these tension points and some of these challenges. And I'm persuaded, I'm quite optimistic that we can work through it because I, I think we have to. It's really an imperative that we work through it given the challenges that we confront in the 21st century. Thanks for the question. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so thank you and thank you to our entire panel for that interesting discussion. Um, so now we'll start the Q&A session. So please, Andrew, take it away. Great, thank you, Heather. Yeah, the uh, number of questions that have come across so far. Um, the first one is uh, for you, Cole. Um, how will 2022 lease areas for offshore wind energy be recycled or reused for new wind farms 25 years from now? Will we run out of wind resource space if we leave the foundation ecosystems behind? Uh, so I at least our vision is that the infrastructure that we put in place as as a as a society should have uh, be long lived, um, and I mean uh, infrastructure in the sense of the nature, the natural infrastructure as well as the the um, human constructed. So, from our standpoint, if we're successful, offshore structures will promote and contribute to life below water, and they will find a life after the twenty five year horizon at least those that are successful, because this is still a space that, frankly, we're, we are all exploring together. Um, and uh, we will not have uh, enough electricity if we don't manage that total load. Uh, so the overall energy system does need to be managed. So uh, if that answers the question, I think there will be, there will be use uh, for a long time in the future. There will be um, repowering that that certainly happens. Uh, and I would hope that in the process, there would be re-enlivening the ocean, ocean ecosystems uh, at the same time. We'll continue to advance, I suppose, would be the, the hope. Great, thank you for that, Cole. And uh, a, a question for you, Joe. Um, Joseph, how will these wedge uh, projects fare in 2050 when sea level rise will be one foot higher than it is now? or projected sea level rise? <laughs> they will fare exceptionally well. So the wedge standards require um, um, a number of different resilience components. Um, most kind of significant in there is uh, around siting and elevation. Um, we, we ask sites to, to um, build beyond the, the 100 year future floodplain so incorporating sea level rise into, into the design and provide further reward for those that build to the 500 year floodplain. Um, so we have uh, a 500 year future floodplain, I should clarify that. Um, so these are, these are projects that are taking climate change and sea level rise seriously uh, because it is um, such a pressing concern. And that was a big part of the motivation for developing the wedge standards in in uh, in the beginning, because if we're going to build along the waterfront, which is going to keep happening, um, you know, this is how we need to design it. Great, and, and just while we're on you, Joseph, uh, another question that has come through is, um, 
have you applied the, the wedge guidelines on uh, port planning prior to construction and how would this be different than uh, post-construction? So the wedge typically comes into the process and, and does a review at two phases. So, um, that, and, and we um, will we'll partner with the, the project sponsor, the, the, the landowner, that, that's who we'll have kind of the, the contract for verification with, even if we're working very closely with the engineers and, uh, and landscape architects mostly. Um, we will do a review in two phases. The first is at the 50% design phase, which allows us to give um, significant feedback in the, in the process um, and identify here are areas where you can enhance resiliency, you can improve access, or you can uh, um, uh, improve the ecology of the site. The verification actually comes once we get to the 100% construction documents phase. So after you've gone through your permitting, after you've gone through different land use processes, that 100% construction document phase is when we do a final review. And then because we're looking at, here's what you're actually gonna build, and it's, it's very unlikely to change at that stage, that's when we provide the, the verification. So all of our, all of our projects are um, verified pre-construction. Excellent. No, thank you very much. And uh, we, we have a number of questions that uh, unfortunately won't be able to get to. I see we're at about the last two minutes and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But uh, just want to, uh, again, thank all of our panelists, um, our hosts, our uh, attendees uh, for your attention for the last hour and hope you found it very useful. Um, the recording will uh, be available as, as well as uh, certificates of attendance. Um, so keep an eye out uh, for just one follow-up email. Um, and uh, again, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. We hope you found it enjoyable and, and insightful and looking forward to seeing you on uh, uh, hopefully part two of this technical series uh, at a later date. Cheers.